Well, today I'm honored to have a very special guest to talk about uh, climate change and the climate crisis. He's both an author and geologist. He's also the executive director of the Climate Coalition. And with me here today is Greg Wrightstone. Welcome, Greg. Oh, thank you so much. Actually, the, the, the organization I lead is the CO2 Coalition. And so that's, uh, we've got some 160 of the top scientists in the world that I'm just so proud to, uh, to be a leader of this group. We have uh, a Nobel laureate that sits on our board, John Klaus, or other distinguished, uh, many, many, many physicists. I'm a geologist, uh, but we promote uh, the little known facts that are, are kept secret and quiet about the many benefits of, of both warming and more CO2. Well, it, it certainly is fascinating, the, the CO2 coalition, which you're the executive director of, Greg. Um, it's fascinating because it, it's almost like in the title, it confronts us with um, a very different set of facts than we're used to hearing because constantly we hear a, um, a drumbeat that CO2, no, uh, specifically carbon dioxide, is a pollutant, but that's not that's not what you're saying, is that right? Oh my goodness, no. The CO2 uh, are, are, is more CO2 has been hugely beneficial to both our ecosystems and and by we're accruing that benefit to us, uh, the human conditions improving, humanity's prospering, because partly more CO2 is driving, and the big the biggest benefit is the increase in agricultural output uh, because CO2's uh, more CO2, of course, if you think back to your early schooling, you learned about photosynthesis. You might have yes. a small cup with soil and you put a bean seed in it. And you learned that and that bean sprouted that three mm -hmm. main things that plants need. It's sunlight, water and CO2. And the more CO2, the better. And you know, we're seeing this, this greening of the earth, vegetation for almost mm -hmm. every ecological niche is, is just uh, exploding. You know, it's, it's so funny you mentioned about the um, reflection uh, of really a childhood memory that probably most of us have done where we put a, as you said, a bean seed into a cup with some soil and we learn those basics around the science of, well, really everything in terms of both plant life, but life on this planet in general is really necessitated and enabled by carbon dioxide is that that's the point isn't it uh, greg it is it is and as a geologist i put this into a long-term perspective of thousands and millions of years and looking at the long-term perspective we see that we're being told that carbon dioxide is a is a dangerously high level and it's, it's increasing uh looking at the long long-term consequence we're actually in a co2 famine uh, we're near historic low levels of Sorry, carbon dioxide. Wait a sec here. You, wait a, you used a term, a CO2 famine. What do you mean by that? Well, we're at, today, as we sit here, we're, we are seeing about 420 parts per million in the atmosphere, atmospheric CO2. Uh, and Earth's history, though, if you look back through to the end of the Precambrian era, mm -hmm. it averaged 2,600 parts per million, six and a half times what it is today. And it's only been in the very recent past, or recent to a geologist over the last several million years, that we have such low levels of carbon dioxide. And, and our plants and our crops that evolved, uh, they, they began during times of uh, carbon dioxide levels of greater than 2,000. Again, we're at 400. And so we're looking at five times the amount of CO2 that these plants originated using. And so, of course, plants, uh, I, since they can't speak, I speak for them. If they had a vote in the matter, they'd be raising, if they hand to, hand to raise, they'd be raising their, their hand and going, more CO2, more CO2. Uh, because although we're a better levels of CO2 that's driving mm -hmm. plant growth, we're still not at optimum levels. Uh, Isn't that, might that not fascinating? Mean. So this is a perspective you will almost never hear within um, the public square and mainstream media. So I'm, I'm fascinating though, um, how do you respond though to the whole idea that, and, and you get this warning on anything on social media, you'll always see that little paragraph saying that um, 
the long-term trend is uh, the concern is about the use of fossil fuels and that carbon dioxide is a problem. So, but, but that's human created. So is, are we talking about two different things here then, Greg? Are we no, talking about no, the difference the, between natural CO2 and human-made CO2? Before the Industrial Revolution began, before we started using coal, oil, and natural gas, uh, CO2 levels, remember we're at 420 today, 400 or so, uh, it was at 280. So that difference between 280 parts per million and 400 parts per million or 420, it's about a 50% increase in the atmosphere. And it's because mm. of us using CO2. It just is. And I'm okay with that because we're seeing many benefits from this. We're seeing that uh, I live a high carbon lifestyle and I'm proud of that. I drive two SUVs. I, I heat my home <laughs> in the winter with natural gas uh, and I, I cool it and, and temperature in my home in the summer is comfortably cool and it's comfortably warm in the winter uh, because as we'll get into a little bit, there is no climate crisis. What they're doing is the warnings you hear will be from models, climate models that can't model temperature very well. We know hmm. that for a fact that they over predict warming um, that okay, so CO2 will, will generate. Gosh, this is again, a, a, a totally different narrative. So, is there a relationship between CO2 and increased temperatures? The warming trend we're in actually started more than 300 years ago, long before we started uh, adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So the first uh, 60 or 70 percent, 75 percent of this warming trend we're in occurred and it had to be naturally driven. And they're telling us now that since 1950, well, it's all, all from CO2. That's just not, it's not true. And we can look at, uh, from almost every metric and, and age length, if you look at decade, decades, hundreds, thousands, and millions of years, uh, there's, there's no relationship between CO2 and temperature. Uh, okay. We do see there is a, we do see over the last several million years that we, when we went into a, a glacial event, things cooled oceans cooled and when cooling oceans suck up huge amounts of co2 mm -hmm. uh, warming oceans that heat up expel co2 so what we see is actually an inverse relationship over uh, the last 800,000 years of of uh, hot periods having having low co2 and and cold periods having high co2 okay so i'm i although as i'm a keen observer of science i'm not a scientist and you are. You're a geologist. I believe you're also on some of the, the UN uh, panels that review the, the science. Um, and you're the executive director of the CO2 Coalition. And you've also written a number of books on these issues. I remember reading your book called uh, Inconvenient Facts, which I loved. Uh, but you've also come up with a more recent book, A Very Convenient Warming. So can you tell us more about why you wrote this book, Greg? Yeah, the first book in, was Inconvenient Facts. I wrote that in 2017. And as recently as two months ago, it was back as a number one bestseller in several categories on Amazon. It's been... Well, congratulations. I've had a number, I've had a number of people I respect that, tells, that tell me that it's the if you're going to buy one book about climate change, get Inconvenient Facts, because it's very readable. I, I didn't dumb it down, but I, I made it so... A non-scientist can understand it, and that that's very necessary. And in inconvenient facts, I I spelled out that there is no climate crisis, and I went, I, I compared and looked at the various crises that are told will experience to find out that uh, there is no climate crisis after all. Uh, this book, though, I've come I've advanced that thinking, and we have here too at the CO2 Coalition, and we find that warming and more CO2 have been greatly beneficial uh, to mankind, to our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Almost every every metric you look at uh, about our ecosystems and the human condition, we see benefits. Fires mm -hmm. aren't increasing, they're decreasing. Deserts aren't expanding, they're shrinking. Food production is breaking records uh, year after year after year, and that's attributable to warming temperatures, which means we have longer growing seasons. Uh, I didn't look what it was in Canada, but uh, the growing season for the continental United States has increased by more than two weeks since 1900. That's a good thing uh, because it's warming 
we see the killing frosts end earlier in the spring and arrive later in the fall, which is huge for agriculture. Uh, and we see that CO2 is driving is a boost, the turbocharging this crop growth. Uh, and, and it's also uh, crops are breaking records because of the use of nitrogen fertilizer, which is derived from fossil fuels. Uh, it's a it, it's really I call it the greatest untold story of the 21st century. That Isn't of that a, something of a thriving earth, a thriving ecosystems. We should celebrate. So, but, but at the heart of this story of thriving ecosystems is the story, the story and the importance of carbon dioxide, among other elements. And these long cycles throughout uh, human history. So the whole narrative uh, that human created uh, carbon dioxide is really the source of all our woes. And is that an accurate message in your opinion? Uh, what we find is that, no, the warming trend that we're in today looks very similar to past warming trends over the last 10,000 years. And we find these other warming trends uh, Going back to the first great civilizations, there were three of them. We're in the fourth warming trend since great civilizations arose uh, during what was called the Bronze Age. It was the Minoan Warm Period. It was very warm at that time. And the great civilizations first arose, the Babylonians, the Hittites, uh, the Assyrians, the Harappan Empire in the Indus River Valley. Uh, all these great civilizations rose up. We know it was a lot warmer from historical records in addition to scientific mm -hmm. uh, proxies is what we call them. We know that, for example, they were growing a crop called millet in Scandinavia, which can only be grown in subtropical areas. So mm -hmm. we know just using historical records like that, we know it was a lot warmer. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can use that historical data uh, to talk about what and we see what we see consistently. And in the second section of my new book, uh, I, I love the relationship between human history and climate history to find that uh, each of the warming periods were, were hugely beneficial to mankind. Again, we had uh, prodigious food production, and it was the cold periods that turned out to be horrific. Each of the cold periods we went into, they went by the names of the Greek Dark Ages, the Dark Ages, and the Little Ice Age. Uh, and we find that the cold periods were horrific. Horrific. The cold periods were associated with crop failure, famine, pestilence, and mass depopulation. The warming periods, warmer than today, were associated with great bounty, great agriculture. Uh, again, life was good. And so what they're, they need to look back, they call me a science denier. I call them history deniers because they're not, they're denying what actually happened during previous warm periods. And those warm periods were uh, marvelously beneficial to the human condition. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.